He was dean first of the College of Social Sciences and then was part of the decision to move the School of Family Life in with the, uh, the college and served for a total of 17 years for the, um, for, as dean. And you'll see also that he was responsible for a number of pretty important things on campus. The Kennedy Center for International Studies, the American Heritage Program, the Women's Research Institute, Family Studies uh, Center, a number of uh, quite important uh, organizations, if you will, on campus that still influence students today. He's quite a remarkable leader, and it's very fitting in our college that we should have this distinguished lecture uh, in his name. The outstanding scholar each year is, is uh, selected by myself with my associate deans, and it does come with uh, a stipend and allocation for research. In addition, just two years ago, with the growth of the endowment, we made the decision to establish and name four teaching awards that are associated with the uh, Martin Hickman name. Uh, these were announced in our fall college meeting, but just for your information, Kevin Merritt received the Excellence in Teaching Award, Scott Braithwaite the Innovative Innovation in Teaching Award, Kendall Brown, the Achievement in Teaching Award, and Julie Hopp, the Excellence in Teaching by Imagine the Ways and Faculty Member. So we honor uh, our former dean with those four teaching awards and also this outstanding scholar lecture. We are pleased also to recognize members of the Hickman family or group who are here with us tonight. Why, why don't we have the Hickman family members stand up if you're related in any way? Please stand. There are several of uh, Martin's daughters here, and then nieces and nephews and others, and we're uh, cousins. We're grateful to have all of you here, and thank you so much for being here. Let's give them a hand. We also are grateful to have the family and friends and students of Dr. Pope. I know there's probably a bunch of econ and students here. Thanks for coming. Finally, before moving on to our lecture, I'd like to announce this year's Martin D. Hickman, Hickman Outstanding Scholar, who will be giving, delivering the lecture approximately one year from now. And that's from Mona Hopkins from the Department of Psychology and the Director of the Neuroscience Center. Ramona, please stand so we can recognize you. We appreciate it. Martin Showalter, the uh, chair of the, of the Department of Economics and a professor there, will now introduce uh, Dr. Pope. Following Dr. Pope's lecture, we'll, uh, we'll have time for a few questions. And then following that, Shelby Anderson, an econ major from Leesburg, Virginia, will give a uh, benediction. Following that, there will be refreshments out in, in the hall. Dr. Showalter. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, C. Arthur Pope. Uh, on the inside of the program, it is a brief bio. Um, it is a pleasure to do this, but it is a little bit daunting. Uh, printing up his CV took about five minutes. Um, now, to give this next intro bit of uh, information, the coin of the realm in academics is citation. Um, and so this is where somebody else cites your work in their published work. And so uh, the median number of citations for a given article in academics is close to zero, like really close to zero. Um, a good article in economics uh, is 20 citations. You get 50 or 100, you've actually had some impact. A few, if you've done really well, you'll get 100, you know, 100 in the hundreds of citations. Is, uh, a slam dunk is like a thousand. You've got a great article. Uh, I looked at this citation before I came over. Uh, Professor Pope's citation count as of today is almost 62,000. <laughs> he has four articles with over 5,000 citations each. Um, he's had a remarkably productive career. Um, I can only, I can't do his career justice in the time I've got. Let me just give you a, a few of the highlights. So he is the Mary Lou Professor, Mary Lou Fulton Professor of Economics here at the university. He received his bachelor's degree here at Brigham University in agricultural economics. I learned through family contacts he was actually started off in English uh, and um, that 
Duff is, you know, he's very well spoken, but I haven't associated with uh, him with an English background. He got a PhD from Iowa State University in 1981, started his academic career at Texas A&M University in 1982. He came to BYU in 1984 to the, what was then the Department of Agricultural Economics. In 1988, that department merged with the Department of Economics. And since that time, he's been at BYU as a professor in the Department of Economics. He uh, has got a uh, numerous list of honors among them. Uh, in 2006, he was named the College Major Distinguished Faculty Lecturer, which is the top honor to faculty at university. This is an honor that recognizes not only scholarly productivity as far as um, uh, academic articles, but also uh, requires that a person be an outstanding teacher and an outstanding citizen in the university. And so he received that honor in 2006. He's received the Utah Governor's Medal for Science and Technology, uh, and the list goes on. Um, now, those are the things that are in your program. It turns out that uh, he, he and his wife have eight sons, and those sons are fonts of information about his life. Uh, so it's fun to kind of get the background. I think you do all the background, I'll give you some highlights. Now, I can't say that there's so many people that I'd be able to introduce, but uh, he spent his first years in a log cabin. Uh, he lived in a log cabin in Cokeville, Wyoming. He was born in Logan. Uh, he moved ultimately to Idaho, where he grew up, his oldest of seven children. Uh, and the word is that he wasn't a great student. Not at, at, at high school, it's kind of hard school, and he slipped into BYU. Uh, the word is that he was academic probation on and off throughout his time at BYU. Now, this contrast with his wife, who was a top nursing student, uh, was a valedictorian, or it was a little unclear whether the top valedictorian or salutatorian. Uh, so there was this interesting uh, contrast between he and his wife, Rhonda. Uh, they are the parents of eight boys, um, and that distribution has changed in the second generation, so the latest count is that they have 14 grandchildren, 12 of whom are granddaughters. Uh, <laughs> so he has acted in so many ways. He's a wonderful colleague. He currently serves as state president in Springville. And without further ado, I'll turn the time over to him for a lecture on his work in <laughs> well, that was pretty good, Mark. <laughs> I, it is true. My wife was Science Woman of the Year, graduated number one in her class. I was accepted to BYU on academic probation. I didn't disappoint them, however. I remained on academic probation for three full semesters. <laughs> um, no, I wasn't that great a student. It's true. Uh, but I'm grateful to be here. Next year, there will be a great lecture. Ramona Ramon is going to just do a bang up job. Uh, she came, came here to see what not to do. Uh, let, me, let me start out by just saying thanks. I, I thank the, uh, the Hickman family. I thank the college. Uh, our, we've got a fine, fantastic college here. I, I want to thank my incredible wife and my family. I uh, also want to thank my BYU colleagues, and especially those in the Department of Economics. I'm fully aware that most of the time I've been here, I've been sort of on the fringe, and yet they've continued to be kind and supportive. I also, how, how many of you here have either had a class from me or taken a class? Yeah, quite a lot of you. I thank my students. This, this university has the most wonderful students. That includes all of the RAs I've gotten to work with, and I'm going to focus mostly on my research today, but <laughs> the TAs are very important with that as well. Uh, they, they very much help me so I can do research. The other thing I want to do is thank the many research collaborators. I'm going to, I've added photos of various collaborators in here, but I want, uh, as I go through this presentation, but I want it to be very clear, I have done basically nothing on my own. Almost everything that I've done uh, no, everything I've done, not almost, has been with really remarkable collaborators, and I, I'm so appreciative of that. So, let's start, oh, what are we going to talk about? Air pollution and health. Uh, 
the top 10 scientific and public policy controversies. Why is it titled that? Because I thought that would be a cool title. That's the <laughs> only reason, okay? But I am gonna try to go through top 10 controversies. So let's start out. Just as a matter of introduction, what do we breathe? Well, basically we breathe pure air, which is mostly nitrogen and oxygen. And we also breathe pollutants in the air, which include various gaseous pollutants. It also includes a lot of particle pollution. Now, particle pollution is often divided up in coarse, into coarse particles. These are particles greater than about two and a half micrometers in aerodynamic diameter. They come primarily from wind-blown dust and various natural processes. But we also breathe a lot of fine particles, and I'll refer to those as PM2.5. That's particulate matter that's two and a half micrometers or less in diameter. And almost all of the PM2.5 particles come from high temperature processes, industrial processes, like smelters, steel mills, or from burning things, like burning coal or diesel or gasoline or wood. And this is what I'm going to focus on in this talk mostly, PM2.5, largely because it's PM2.5 that causes most of the health, health effects, okay? I'm all, but of course, there are others. There's ozone, as you see, I have sort of highlighted in red, uh, also an important uh, pollutant that I'm mostly going to ignore this, this lecture. There are also other air toxics of which I'm going to ignore. Now, first, just to give you a feel of how small a PM2.5 particle is. So a human hair, the width of a human hair, and Rhonda, I need my other one. This one isn't very good. I got it, I think. Uh, the width of a human hair is about 60 micrometers. So if you take the end of a human hair, that is a PM2.5 particle. It's about that size. Now, most of the particles, of course, are even smaller than that. Remember, PM2.5 includes those that are that size and smaller. Now, to get you, give you another feel, here are magnified fine particles on a filter. The width of this slide is about 25 micrograms per cubic meter. So the width of a hair would be about the width of this whole front end of this room, from wall to wall, all right? And that particle right there is about two and a half micrometers. So these are extremely tiny particles, and they can penetrate deep into your lungs, and of course that's the, one of the main problems. They, they're, they're made up of lots of nasty stuff, and they also can penetrate deep into the lungs. Now, you can't with your naked eye see a, a fine particle, the particle's this fine, but when the, when the concentrations of the particles get high enough, you'll get this really nasty air like you, like you see right here, this is in New Delhi, uh, Agra, that's actually the Taj Mahal. I, I spent, spent uh, half a month earlier this year uh, in these places doing air pollution stuff, uh, Beijing, China, really bad air pollution in many parts of the world. Lots of people live in areas with very bad air pollution. Now, of course, even during our bad temperature inversions, this is Salt Lake City, and it can get quite bad. So, let's start with the 10 controversies. We've got to count them down. We don't have a lot of time. Let's start at the beginning, all right? Number one, was London smog romantic or deadly? Now, you chuckle a bit, but that really was a controversy. You see, see these paintings of you know, Mary Poppins? Oh, that was really romantic. Even, uh, even Monet loved to do paintings of London, especially when there was a lot of fog and smog in the air. So that's the Houses of Parliament, and, uh, you know, by Monet. That's what it really looks like. And I think it's pretty close to the same vantage point. Pretty amazing, isn't it? But even as er early as, you know, in the 1700s, 1800s, they were beginning to understand that air pollution can cause problems. Here's a cartoon from a British humor magazine in 1880 of old King Cole and the fog demon bringing asthma and bronchitis and pneumonia and pleurisy to London. <laughs> kind of a cool cartoon. It's not very funny, however. <laughs> Here's another one of Monet. Monet was, seemed, to, he had, he seemed to love the fog sometimes and hate it other times. And this is a photo, again, this is Waterloo Bridge. This is what it looks like today in London. The bridge has been rebuilt, but you can see the smokestacks and the pollution 
in London. Now, romantic or deadly? That controversy was basically resolved in the 1930s through the 1950s with three major air pollution episodes, one in Meuse Valley, Belgium, another in Donora, Pennsylvania, and another one right there in London in 1952. The reality is, is the air pollution got so high and so many people died, there was really no doubt that air pollution caused disease and death. Um, in fact, this is, sort of, this is London in the middle of the day. It's kind of fun. This is Donora, Pennsylvania at noon. Um, the pollution was unbelievably bad. Here's, here's the episode in, in December 1952 in London. The smoke and the sulfur oxides jumped up very high, got extremely high. This is about 1.5 1 uh, milligrams, so about a, 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 a 1,500 micrograms per cubic meter, outrageously high. And you can see mortality jumped up and stayed high, actually didn't get back to baseline for about two weeks. David Bates was, uh, was at St. Bart's in London. I was a young uh, chess physician there. I actually got to know David and work with him for, for about 20 years. Uh, he's, he's, he died recently, but he was, this is when he was at British Columbia and used to work with him. We talked about this London fog episodes quite often. There was no doubt by those that treated, uh, in, in the minds of those that treated patients, as well as those that analyzed the data, that air pollution at high enough concentrations wasn't romantic, it was deadly. And in fact, as a result of these killer smog episodes in the United Kingdom and the United States, we have public policy, started public policy for, for example, in the US, the 1970 Clean Air Act and the amendments and the establishment of the EPA and establishment of national ambient air quality standards really resulted in the elimination of these extreme killer smog episodes in the US and in the UK. So, first controversy knocked off, haven't we? Second controversy, can short term, moderate levels of pollution hurt us? Or, or after, after eliminating those killer smogs, have we eliminated the problem of air pollution? It turns out that much of the information, or at least some of the important information, comes right here from Utah County. Okay? Utah County is an interesting place. We sit in a valley, which is a natural exposure chamber. And that's especially true when temperature, uh, temperature inversions trap the pollution on the valley floor. The other interesting thing is, at least in the 1980s, about 50% of our PM2.5 air pollution came from one source, Geneva Steel, an integrated steel mill that operated up in Vineyard, up by, by, by Orem. It contributed about 50% of the pollution, but yet it shut down and then reopened, shut down for about 13 months. A classic natural experiment, okay? Kind of cool thing to look at. Um, here is the steel mill back there, kind of polluted and hazy. That's David Bates, that uh, chess physician uh, from St. Bart's, a number of other uh, collaborators of the early, in the early 1990s. But you can see, that's what the steel mill looks like when we were, we were, at a work, we were doing a workshop here at BYU, and they wanted to take a photo in front of the infamous steel mill. They were joking about, man, if somebody had just wreck our van, it'd kill all of the air pollution researchers at the time. <laughs> Here's what the valley looked like at really bad days. This is a, really a bad foggy day. That's Geneva Steel sitting right there. Can you see it? No, you can't see anything. We're up above the inversion layer looking out across it, right? And you look here, and you wonder, there are about 250,000 people living down there, children with asthma, adults with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and others living in that. You have to ask yourself, does that impact our health? Well, that natural experiment with the steel mill shutting down and reopening demonstrated the steel mill, in fact, did dramatically change air pollution and basically what we saw is that pediatric respiratory hospital admissions were roughly twice as high when the steel mill was operating versus when it was closed. Now, there was a lot of mini controversy that went on here in Utah over this 
this in a, in, a, in a subsequent study, but we don't have time to talk about it. Even ignoring the intermittent operation of the steel mill, we can look at a lot of variability that naturally exists in the valley, simply as a result of temperature inversions trapping the pollutants, a little bit like putting a lid on the valley and having the pollutants build up and then taking it off and then putting it back on. So you get these dots are 24-hour average PM 2.5 concentrations. You can see them bouncing around. So we can, we can take that exposure variability and utilize it to see, is it associated with various adverse health outcomes? So what's a good adverse health outcome to look at? Let's look at dead or alive, shall we? Okay. What we have here is the mortality counts for five years in Utah Valley. So you can see on some days nobody dies, on other days one person dies, two people die, etc. Now let's don't do anything fancy, no fancy statistical modeling. Let's just sort that data by quartiles of air pollution and then take the average deaths per day across quartiles of air pollution. No fancy modeling, just sorting basically. And that's what you get up here in this. You see air, air pollution gets higher, we see this increase in daily death count. Now, we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out the best way to make inferences from this. And back in the late 80s, early 90s, the, the controversy on this was quite high. I was working mostly with Joel Schwartz. He was a statistical physicist that was way smarter than me. And, and we were trying to figure out the best way to model it, and we came up with, we were basically doing these semi-non-parametric Poisson models, estimating these facts, uh, effects. Joel was doing it in Steubenville, Ohio, and in, and in Philadelphia. I was doing it here in Utah. Uh, there was this big reanalysis project that went on with Scott Zeger, a biostatistician at Hopkins, and a team there. The bottom line is, is at first we sort of disagreed on things, but eventually we kind of converged to, to the basically the same models. And in the end, the, the controversy basically went away when whole bunches of other researchers started doing these same sort of studies in literally hundreds of cities throughout the world. Uh, a couple of prominent researchers, uh, John Samet, who was at Hopkins at the time, did studies uh, in up to, t uh, up to 100 cities in the United States. Clea was uh, and her research team did up to 29 cities in Europe. Uh, there were a number of studies done in Asia, in Canada, in South America. Um, now there's been studies all done through, throughout China, uh, India, et cetera. So, short-term changes in air pollution exposure are associated with daily deaths, hospitalization, lung function, res uh, symptoms of respiratory illness. There's a whole series of these studies. Uh, Michael Ransom, I know you're here somewhere. Where are you at? So back there, Michael's been so helpful with uh, doing a lot of these studies. We, we did one again just, just a year or so ago. Uh, Delbert Etot here at, at BYU and other colleagues at University of Utah and, and Harvard have been very involved with helping with these studies. Did we resolve the, con the, the, the controversy? Largely we did. It's pretty clear that short-term exposure to even moderate levels of pollution can hurt us. So that leads us to the third controversy. What about long-term exposures? Can they contribute to significant disease and loss of life? I got very lucky. In, in, uh, in the early 1990s, I took a fellowship at Harvard. And I'd been working with Doug Dockery and Frank Spicer and others there already. But shortly after I got there, they had finished up a 14 to 16 year follow up of, of a cohort of people from six different cities. This was a study specifically designed to evaluate air pollution and long term chronic exposures. They asked me if I'd be willing to help analyze that data. And of course, I jumped at it. It was a wonderful opportunity. We had three or two polluted cities, two relatively clean cities, two cities sort of in the middle. This is just classic uh, sort of crude survival curves. You can see that the people are dying more rapidly in the more polluted cities than in the clean cities. But of course, you want to model these data in more sophisticated ways, controlling for age, sex, race, cigarette smoking, body mass index, and a whole bunch of other individual risk factors. But when you do that, this is what you get. 
you get an increased risk of mortality associated with increased pollution across these six cities. And when we plotted that, when we finished this up, you look at that and basically what do you think? You're cheating, right? It looks, like, it looks like we're cheating. It seems like such a clean association. We were very uncomfortable with these results. They were bigger than we expected. And so what we tried to do is find an alternative data set that we could analyze. We went to Michael Toon and Eugene Cal and later Susan Gapster at the American Cancer Society. And they agreed to work with us, linking a big cohort, they called the Cancer Prevention two, uh, Study 2 cohort, with air pollution data and analyze it in a similar way as we did with the Harvard Six City study. Now, there's many, many more observations and it, and, and it, and it took, I, I, I ended up having to fly down to Atlanta and we would use the CDC mainframe computer back then and run it overnight to, to do the analysis. The bottom line is, is we got results qualitatively and almost quantitatively the same as the Harvard Six City study. Well, that caused us more problems than we ever expected. We published both of them, one in the New England Journal of Medicine, the other in the American Review of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. And as a result of those studies and the previous time series studies, in 1997, the US EPA proposed new national ambient air quality standards for PM 2.5. But that resulted in a, in a firestorm, basically. Uh, 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 Jocelyn Kaiser in, in the journal Science indicated that industry and environmental researchers are squaring off over studies linking air pollution and illness in what some are calling the biggest environmental fight of the decade. Basically, there were calls for independent validation and reanalysis of various studies, especially the Harvard Six Cities and the ACS studies, and there were also legal challenges by various industry groups. The, the, the classic one with the American Trucking, Trucking Association. So what did we do? Well, first off, we said, sure, we want this to be reanalyzed. And so we actually shared, with, with confidentiality, we shared um, our data with a research team of 31. So these three guys and, thir and 28 other people, with the oversight of the Health Effects Institute, to reanalyze our our, our studies, the ACS and the, and the Harvard Six City study. Basically, they did a formal audit of the data, they reproduced the published results, they, conduct, they conducted robustness and sensitivity analysis, and they basically confirmed, it took about three years, three and a half years, but they eventually, they confirmed our, our initial results. Uh, about a year later, the legal uncertainty was largely resolved with a 2001 unanimous ruling by the Supreme Court that ultimately allowed for the establishment of these national PM 2.5 standards. So, uh, while that's all going on, these cohorts were following up more people. More of them are dying, there's longer follow-up time. In addition to that, I'm working with Rick Burnett, trying to deal with some other statistical controversies with regards to these Cox proportional hazard models. So we're really trying to develop these models that allow for random effects and spatial autocorrelation issues and, and, and wanted to do these semi-non-parametric spatial smoothing things. Won't go into that in any detail except for to say, after we, after we got this largely resolved, we used that new approach with the Harvard, well, I'm sorry, with the ACS data with a longer follow-up period using the, 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 the improved Cox model and, um, and published this in the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association, and here are basically the, the, the results. You can see, wow, air pollution is associated with all-cause mortality, but it's driven almost entirely by cardiopulmonary, that's lung and cardiovascular mortality, and lung cancer. Now, to, just to kind of, with, because this is an important part of the literature, just to kind of put this into perspective, remember we did the Harvard Six City study first, and then we that led us to, to try to replicate our results with this study. The controversy came, so we had this three-year reanalysis by this research team. After that, however, we continued to do extended analyses on both of these studies, the Harvard Six City study, as well as the, the uh, ACS study. But what's important to note is it's okay to reanalyze the same data and do extended analysis, 
but there have now been replicative studies in many other cohorts, in Germany, in the Netherlands, uh, in the United States, in California, New Zealand, in China, uh, 22 cohorts in, in, in Europe. The controversy tends to go away a bit, just like with the time series studies, when more and more people can see the same results in additional cohorts. Does that make sense? So, does long-term exposure contribute to significant disease and loss of life? Yeah. So does reducing air pollution improve and reduce mortality? Well, I just wanted to show this. I had nothing to do with this study, but it's so wonderful. They did, the, for, for decades, there's been this Southern California Children's Health Study, and Southern California's had some rough pollution over the years. And it was clearly associated with children having deficits in lung function and more respiratory disease. But over the last few decades, as we've been cleaning up in California, they're seeing that in fact, the cleanup has really improved the health of children in Southern California. Another just interesting one to look at is this one. Remember the Harvard Six City study, uh, uh, Francine Layden and, and, and the crew there at Harvard redid those results later after there'd been eight years of substantial cleanup in those cities. And even controlling for these other individual risk factors, you see that a reduction in pollution in Steubenville and in Kingston and in Watertown and in St. Louis and even in the two cleanest cities, cleanup resulted in lower mortality risk. Uh, Doug Dockery, Majid Azadi, and then later with a follow-up, Francesca Dominici and I did a number of studies looking at, um, these are basically differences and differences analyses where the hypothesis is, is in the United States across a 20-year period where there are big changes in pollution for many cities, where, there different, where, uh, where the differential reductions in pollution that occurred in this two-decade period associated with differential improvements in life expectancy. Now again, without going into the details, the answer turned out to be yes. A 10 microgram per cubic meter decrease in PM 2.5 was associated with almost a year increase in life expectancy. In fact, the estimates were as during that 20 year time period, almost 25% of the improvement in life expectancy occurred because of reductions in air pollution. So, does reducing air pollution improve health and reduce mortality? Yes. Next controversy. Well, how low should we go? Is there even a safe threshold where air pollution doesn't cause at least some damage? And in fact, the, 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 the U.S. Clean Air Act requ requires the, UT, uh, the, the EPA to set air quality standards that are requisite to protect the public health with an adequate margin of safety. That implicitly assumes that there's some threshold of concentrations of air pollution of which there are no effects, and then effects beyond that. Is this true? The answer doesn't seem to be, seems to be no. In fact, go back to London again. Bart Ostro and Joel Schwartz analyzed these data in very careful ways, and what you see is that you have this concentration response function that seems to be really steep and then leveling off. We've done a number of these studies, just show you some of them. Here's London, Detroit, here's some work we did here in Utah Valley. This is some other work with Paulo Saldiva that I did in, in Sao Paulo. Here's the work Joel and, and Doug were doing in Philadelphia. There's no clear evidence of a threshold. And when we did even more sophisticated non-parametric smoothing approaches, even these meta-smoothing approaches using multiple cities, we just never could see any evidence of a threshold. And that was true in the short-term studies, these longer-term exposure studies, again, no evidence of a threshold. So, does a safe threshold even exist? Doesn't appear to be so. It seems like, at least within the range of exposures that we've been looking at, it appears to be near linear. Well, that leads us to one of the more interesting controversies. And that has to do, if the PM 2.5 health effects are this big, and you have a linear exposure response function, why isn't everyone who smokes dead? Think about this for a minute. It really works this way. So look at this. If you're a smoker, your risk of dying are roughly twice as high as if you're not. Now, when I talk risk of dying, I'm talking about 
the risk of dying on any given time period conditional upon living to that time period. We all die, but in any, in any specific point in time, we don't want to, right? So it turns out that at any specific point in time, conditional upon living to there, smokers have twice as large a risk of dying as do non-smokers. But they're exposed, if they're, burning, if they're smoking about a pack of cigarettes a day, they're exposed to about 240 milligrams of PM 2.5. Now, if I were to do a linear extrapolation from that excess risk and that exposure, linear extrapolation down to no exposure and no risk. This is one, but that means it's a relative risk. So relative risk of one is no excess risk. If I do that, then I look up here, and this is the effects we're getting from uh, secondhand smoke and from uh, air pollution. Now, they look like they're on the horizontal axes. They're not. The reason they look like it is because the exposure is so low. Now, you go, well, if the exposure is that low relative to smoking, how can you still get this big effect? And what's the answer? I don't know. But maybe, maybe this isn't really linear, OK? Maybe it's not linear throughout that range. Ah. So basically what we did, this is I'm using the American Cancer Society data again, and I'm estimating the excess risk associated with smoking just a couple of cigarettes a day, or four to seven cigarettes a day, or eight to 12 or whatever. And it turns out that the exposure response function is near linear. But look at this. Does it go through the origin? It doesn't. In fact, right here, there's about a 60% excess risk, right at, right at the intercept about a 60% excess risk of dying. There's something magically dangerous about those first puffs of cigarettes, isn't there? That's what it suggests. Now, if we, if we do this, let's add in secondhand cigarette smoking literature and the air pollution literature and fit a, a, a line, a, a fit a curve through the data, it actually looks more like that. It appears to be curve linear. Maybe we just are scaling this wrong. Is a linear scale right, do you think? What, what, what scale should we use? Yeah. Let's rescale this, shall we? A log, you got it. Yeah, let's scale that to a log. This is what it looks like over log of exposure. Pretty interesting, isn't it? OK. We did this analysis again. Uh, and, and saw the same thing with non-malignant uh, mortality, but interestingly enough, with lung cancer mortality, it's not, it's not perfectly linear, but it, it still keeps going up. Man, I'll tell you, uh, cigarette smoking really impacts uh, lung cancer in a way that's clearly different than non-malignant cardiopulmonary disease. So, if the effects of smoking are, of, of PM are this big and near linear, why isn't everyone who smokes dead? Because it's not linear. There seems to be this saturation phenomena, this, this um, declining marginal effect with regards to the air pollution, or with regards to exposure to PM 2.5. Okay? So, that leads us to the seventh controversy. Are these health effects even biologically plausible? Now, even as early as the late 1990s, I was trying to understand the pathophysiological mechanisms. But you need to understand, I was really bad at it. I, I, I was having a hard time understanding it. I was working, for example, one of the first studies I did was with Paulo Saldiva. He's a pathologist at the uh, Faculty of Medicine at University of Sao Paulo. The interesting thing is there, they probably do more autopsies in his hospital than any other place in the world. So using data, from autopsies of people that died of violent deaths, often traffic accidents, and looking at their lung tissue, we did observe that those that were exposed to higher levels of air pollution had more evidence of inflammation in their lungs. Uh, I was also doing work here looking at, we were hanging these ambulatory ECG monitors on people, looking at effects of fine particles on cardiac autonomic function and cardiac uh, rhythm, uh, cardiac arrhythmias, we were seeing these effects. We were also doing this in elderly. Uh, we had one study with 88 elderly in Utah where we, we found that PM 2.5 was associated with blood markers of inflammation 
and, and heart rate variability, indicators of cardiac autonomic function. But still, we didn't really, couldn't really figure out what was going on. Probably the first paper I did that sort of, that, that had some traction in terms of biological mechanisms was this, where we were doing again epidemiologic evidence of general pathophysiologic uh, uh, pathways of disease. And essentially we were finding, again, this is working with uh, John Goodleski at uh, another pathologist at Harvard and Eugene Cal at ACS. But the bottom line is, is we found that um, the biological mechanisms seem to include pulmonary and systemic inflammation, accelerated atherosclerosis, and altered cardiac autonomic function. And we did, we did this other study here in Utah. Actually, uh, I, I went up and I actually saw that there was another study done with this, this almost 13,000 well-defined cardiac patients who lived on Utah's Wasatch Front. And I asked them if they'd be willing to collaborate with me and looking at the impacts of air pollution on ischemic heart disease events, so heart attacks and related, related events. Now what's interesting is, is that all of these patients had undergone an, uh, coronary angiography. So we could look at their coronary arteries and see if they had occluded arteries, see if they had diseased coronary arteries. And what we found was very clearly that air pollution, increased air pollution, increased the risk of having one of these ischemic heart disease events, but only in those that had existing coronary artery disease. Okay, that had, had seriously occluded coronary arteries. Well, this is all going on. This literature is growing and growing by, you know, by leaps and bounds. In, in 2011, uh, Robert Brooke and Sanjay Rajapalan and, 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 and myself and, a, and another group of individuals were asked to write this scientific statement for the American Heart Association. And as part of that, we were trying to come up with sort of what are the biological mechanisms. Now I'm gonna be honest with you, this is crazy. It's too complicated hardly to understand. I understand that. But I wanna show you sort of an easier way to look at what we're doing right now. This is, this is what we seem to, uh, th what seems to be happening. You breathe fine particles into your lungs, whether from smoking or from air pollution. That then, results in pulmonary and systemic inflammation and oxidative stress. That along with blood lipids then results in endothelial injury and dysfunction and progression and destabilization of atherosclerotic plaques. So let me help you with this for just a minute. What do I mean by the endothelial? So what, it, by endothelial dysfunction? Well, our, our blood vessels, here's some arteries and here's a vein, our blood vessels are made up of connective tissue, smooth muscle, and the very inner layer of your blood vessels is, is the endothelium. It turns out that endothelial disease is what kills more people in the world than any other disease. Because endothelial disease is what is coronary artery disease that results in ischemic heart disease and heart failure and, and even ischemic stroke and even some of the peripheral arterial uh, I'm sorry, the, um, uh, the uh, deep, vein, deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolisms are often as a result of this disease. Does that make sense? So what happens is, is this endo if you get damage to the endothelium, here's another way to look at it, the endothelium, that layer right in there, you get damage, you'll often get this buildup of these lesions, these atherosclerotic lesions, and they start building up, building up, and they're, they're, they're consistent now with the epidemiology literature that air pollution contributes to these types of diseases. Okay, so that leads us to uh, a paper we just published a few months ago with Aruni Bhatnagar and Tim O'Toole at University of Louisville, where we wanted to see if we could see evidence that this was in fact the case. And so we, we're, we wanna look at endothelial injury as well as systemic inflammation. So what did we do? We enrolled research subjects here at Utah, right, right here at BYU. Most of them were BYU students or their spouses or friends. 72 young, healthy, non-smoking adults from BYU. Great place to study, why? Because nobody smokes, nobody lives with smokers, nobody's working with smokers, nobody's going to school with smokers, and we have air pollution episodes. And we can't, we can't control their exposure, but we can, ex we can control the timing of our blood draws. Okay, so that's what we've done. We, we, we enrolled these folks and then we, 
We take draw, blood draws from them on relatively clean and polluted periods over a period of three years, process the blood here at BYU, ship it off to University of Louisville where microparticles and immune cells are quantified using this big multi-laser flow cytometer. We also split, uh, send plasma to EVE Technologies to measure human cytokines, 42 of them, and two markers of endothelial adhesion. Now, then we analyze that data. Now, obviously, I don't have time to go through this in a lot of detail, but you can see the first year, wow, that was a pretty bad pollution episode. And here's a moderate pollution episode. We're, we're timing our blood draws when we have periods of really high pollution, moderate pollution, low pollution. We do this over a period of three years. What did we learn? Basically, we learned that exposure to air pollution was very, very strongly associated with endothelial microparticles, which is, a, which is very strong evidence of damage to the blood vessels. And by the way, we see this with endothelial microparticles kind of across the board, and it's, they're all significant, even controlling, or even adjusting for multiple testing. In addition to that, we see immune cell responses. And again, I won't go into the details here, but very clear evidence of nonspecific inflammatory immune responses. In addition to that, we have all of these cytokines and these um, adhesion molecules. So I'm just showing you sort of the effects. This, these are sort of mean adjusted effect estimates with 95% confidence intervals. But a statistical interpretation of this is, ah, we have some things that are very positively associated with air pollution and some that are negative. Uh, it's a good thing Aruni Bhatnagar was working with me on this because I had no idea how to figure out what this meant. Okay, but the bottom line is, is and I would go into this, to, to, I mean, he, he could look at this, and, oh, we've got what's called an anti-angiogenic plasma profile. Basically, what's going on is we have a bunch of these cytokines that are pro-inflammatory and has, that, that cause damage, vascular damage, along with the adhesion molecules resulting in more vascular damage and possible atherogenesis. That is the, the beginning of the buildup of these atherosclerotic lesions. In addition to that, these negative ones are actually those that are associated with repair. So basically, you have more damage, less repair. It was a, it was a remarkable uh, set of results. Um, the bottom line is, is you breathe particles into your lungs, they get down into your alveoli, they interact with these alveolar macrophages, it ticks them off, they release cytokines, and it starts this cascade of inflammatory and immune responses that contribute to the vascular injury and, and, and the atherogenesis, that is the beginning of this atherosclerotic disease and other cardiovascular disease. Bottom line, whoops. Seventh controversy, are these health effects biologically plausible? Ah, there's a lot that still needs to be learned, but it seems like they are. Eighth controversy, aren't air pollution health effects extremely small compared to other more important risk factors? Okay, so what, right? Well, the answer is no. <laughs> um, so I'm just a bit player in this. There's literally hundreds of researchers involved in what's called the Global Burden of Disease Study, okay? The Global Burden of Disease Study includes researchers dealing with all sorts of risk factors. But notice they estimate that the, 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 the risk factors that have the biggest burden of disease globally and one of the interesting things is, you see, tobacco smoking, household air pollution from solid fuel, ambient particulate matter air pollution. The global burden of disease study shows us one thing. What we eat, what we drink, and what we breathe impacts our health. Now, that shouldn't surprise us much, right? Three of the top ten uh, uh, factors that influence global burden of disease was, uh, was associated with breathing contaminants. Now, in 2015, the latest global burden of disease suggests that air pollution is about the fourth to sixth largest contributor to burden of disease in the world. Now, this wouldn't be true in Utah County. It's not true in the US, okay? This is, these, these huge numbers come largely because of the massive exposure of pollution in China and in, in India and in Pakistan. I understand that. But it's big. 
If you, if you talk about the number of deaths per year from uh, air pollution, about 4.2 million deaths is the estimate. Now that's less than tobacco smoking, but still fairly substantial. If you add the deaths from uh, household air pollution, now we have almost none of that in the US, but again, in Pakistan, in, in India, in China, a lot of people are exposed to massive concentrations of air pollution from indoor uh, sources. And, and so these contributions uh, to, to disease is substantial. All right, eighth controversy. Aren't air pollution and, and health effects just small? No, they're substantial, no doubt about it. Ninth controversy, cleaning up the air pollution costs too much and hurts our economy. Now, I'm an economist. This should be, you should have to sit here for another hour <laughs> to go through this. And I actually just prepared a talk on economic principles and air pollution management to give next week at another venue. And I would love to give it to you here. The truth is, however, I'm just going to give you a flyby. Basically, clean air versus polluted air is among our economic choices. Clean air is an economic good that contributes to human well-being, human capital, and positive environmental amenities. The production of clean air can contribute to economic prosperity, human well-being, and improve public health. This is, it, it turns out, remember I showed you that you got that, that diminishing marginal effects of air pollution. It turns out that that causes the economic analysis to not look like what we see in the textbooks. And I'm not going to go into the details there other than to say it's very clear that air pollution abatement gets more expensive as you abate more pollution on the margin. What's crazy is, is that the literature suggests that we have a near linear or even maybe a super linear exposure response relationship, which means that we get substantial marginal benefits of pollution abatement, even at relatively clean areas. Now, there have been studies, that I wasn't involved with this study at all, but studies trying to look at the benefits and costs of, in this case, the Clean Air Act from 1990 to 2000. They have, uh, of course, they, you know, they have a counterfactual, and then they have what they'd expect to happen uh, based on the cleanup and you get these benefits that exceed the costs. I mean, these benefits are almost uh, unimaginable, almost unbelievable. Uh, but they are big, there's no question about it. And it does appear, almost any analysis you do, the benefits of improving our air quality are substantial. Just as a very crude way to look at it, this is, uh, th so on, on, this, on this vertical axis, you're looking at percent growth or reduction, and here you're looking over time. So right here, is 1970 with the beginning of the Clean Air Act and, and the establishment of the EPA. Since 1970, look at this. Th this. This again is an aggregation, but air pollution has been declining in the United States substantially. It's down about 70% from what it was. So while we're reducing our air pollution, are we destroying our economy? No, I mean, uh, GDP's been growing, it's up to you know, 250% two, 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 uh, higher. Vehicle miles, uh, vehicle miles traveled's been going up. Our population has gone up. Energy consumption's gone up, although it's uh, kind of leveled off. We do still see this increase in CO2 emissions, but it's now starting to decline as well. The bottom line is it does appear we can have a vibrant economy and clean air. Tenth controversy. How much evidence is needed before efforts to have clean air are no longer controversial? I have no more slides. Thank you. <laughs> huh? take a couple of questions? All right, I'm fine with that. Let's just take a couple of questions. Here, maybe two. Go ahead. Hey, Professor. My question for you is, uh, do you think that, you know, it sounds like the U.S. has gotten a lot better. Do you think that other countries can uh, follow that example, or is there something going on where, like, they're outsourcing air pollution or something? Yeah, well, there's some of that actually happening, no question about it. Part of the reason we're cleaner is because we don't have as many steel mills. 
<laughs> China has more. Uh, but uh, a, lot of it's, uh, a lot of it is we are making substantial efforts. We drive more cars, and our cars are way cleaner. They're, not, they're contributing way less. I'm hoping other countries, well, let's say this. Other countries have done a better job. Most of Western Europe's done a better job. Uh, uh, Canada's done a better job. Mexico City, which used to be a re remarkably polluted area, still is polluted, but it's improving. So yes, some countries can improve, but there's no question that there are some countries that over the last couple decades have gotten worse. China, India, especially Northern India, uh, I, I, you know, they've just gotten really bad. And I'm, I mean, for, for the health of those people. You, go, you go, and, go to Northern India and you ask a child, what color is the sky? Most of them say gray or brown. It's just, it's not a pleasant place to live in places that are that polluted. It's just, it's not good. Next question. I don't know who the next one was, yeah. So, Professor, you mentioned that for certain of the, for a couple specific controversies, there was significant pushback to your results. Did that, how many of those studies had significant pushback and did it decrease over time? Did it stay fairly constant? Did, what were the effectors of that pushback? Oh, it cycles. So after the, after the Supreme Court ruling and the, the reanalysis report, it seemed like there was about 10 years there where we were left alone. But the last four or five years have gotten bad again. Uh, now there's discussion of this is secret science and there's the Secret Science Reform Act and we've been subpoenaed with, for the data. And, and uh, you know, some of the data is not, not uh, uh, private so we can actually give it. But, but for those that, those that uh, for those that don't like this research, uh, nothing is enough. There no, you know, the, the, the paralysis by analysis is basically what many want to see happen. Um, so I do wonder, that last question is serious. When do we have enough evidence that it's no longer controversial to try to have clean air? Yeah. Yeah, there's some evidence of that. Um, I mean, if people are starving, they don't worry so much about clean air. Uh, and we're, we're seeing in China, a, lo a lot of the demand for cleaner air in China is coming from the increasingly affluent Chinese in these Chinese cities that are, that are so polluted. It, there's, it, it, in, in India, we're seeing a little of that as well, but it seems to be slower. Um, but yeah, I. I don't know, I don't think of, air pollu or of clean air as necessary a luxury good, but it is to a certain degree. Uh, you do want to, have, you want to have the things you need to sustain a good life. But, but after you have a lot of those sort of basic necessities, it turns out having clean air is really nice. Let's stop there. You can come down and ask your question after if you would. I'm going to present uh, Dr. Pope with this platform. And let's thank him one more time.